Well, the August exams are over, so what do we do now? We have a November exam in front of us. We have level one results that are out in a couple of days from July, and then August results aren't out till the end of October, beginning of November. At least uh, I'll give you my best guess as to when I think they'll be out. Always big secrecy involved with when the results will be released, and I don't know why. And then I want to talk to you about uh, two more topics. Uh, one is uh, feature lists. We're going to talk about features uh, and probably one of the most important features that seem to be missing from most feature lists. Uh, and then we'll finish up um, with uh, a conversation uh, about process. So let's have a look at uh, what we have here. Uh, July results. Uh, we are already told when they'll be out. September 14th. It's September 12th as I do this, so uh, two more days, 48 hours or less than 48 hours. And level one candidates who wrote in July will have the results. Um, so you have a decision whether you're going to write level two in February or whether you're going to wait uh, until August to write. You have 153 days from September 14th to the February exam, at least to the first day. Uh, of the exam period, 153 days. If you wait till August, you have way more than 300 days, which is uh, probably more time than what you need. Uh, only you can decide whether or not five months, 153 days is about five months, whether five months is enough time for you. For those who wrote in August, level one, um, we'll talk about level one, two, and three, but we'll focus on level one first. I'll do level two and level three down here. Um, I anticipate either uh, October 19th or October 26th or somewhere in between uh, that particular uh, period of time uh, would be the results. That would give you 118 days. If we use October 19th, that gives you 118 days uh, to February. You're losing 35 days by waiting uh, for your results or 309 days to get to August. If you are doing the February exam, you're set up for uh, level three in November of 2022 and if you wait until August to do the level 2 exam then you have to wait till May of 2023 to do level 3. However, if you don't have the work requirement behind you there's no sense in racing through the levels. Uh, the level 1 exam and the level 2 exam they don't expire. You can, uh, you can stretch it out for as long as you want. So if you have no real pressing reason why you need to get it done by a certain date, I'm always of the thinking that more time is better. It's not as if it costs you more to wait, unless it does cost you more in terms of career prospects to wait. Uh, but if you are going to wait until results are released, then I would seem to think that you're going to select August more than likely as your uh, level two choice and maybe take a month or two off and enjoy your uh, your fall season and enjoy Christmas before you get at it. Uh, if you're going to make a run for February and if you're waiting for the results to be released, you're going to lose 35 days. Uh, but um, you can use uh, a low-cost, uh, no-cost strategy that we've had for, for uh, you know uh, quite a few years where we suggest that you buy one of the sections, one or two of the sections at level two that feed back onto level one. So if you, uh, let's say, do equity or derivatives or alternative investments or corporate finance and you don't make it back past level one, you get your results and you didn't make it, what you did at level two sort of reinforces what you did at level one. So it does help uh, to some degree. Uh, and if you do pass level one, well, you're one or two sections further along than you would be. So that's how you can buy yourself uh, an extra 35 days. Level 2 has 47 readings. It's a lighter in, in terms of the number of pages than Level 1. But it's not easier. Level 1 would be considered, you know, if you think about it in university terms, a survey course. And a survey course looks at the whole field and just touches on a little bit. Like it's an inch deep but a mile wide and it just covers a whole bunch of topics. Level 2 is evaluation level. So on each of the uh, each of the asset classes, you go uh, quite deep in valuing uh, each of the uh, each of the securities in in the asset classes. So there's a lot more uh, rigor, a lot deeper analysis involved at each of the readings. So even though it's 47 readings, which is you know 
10, 12, 13 readings lighter than level one. Each of the readings is heavier, cognitively heavier. But giving yourself an extra 35 days just by picking up a section or two uh, can certainly help. Let's look at uh, level two. Um, you're going to have the results out a week later. So I think somewhere between October 26th and November 2nd uh, will be the level two results. If, if level one is October 19th, level two will be October 26th. Uh, so well, all you have to do is just you know look for when level one is going to be released. Level two will be a week later because the exams finished roughly about a week later than the level one exams. So somewhere between October 26th and November 2nd, um, you only have May of 2022 for level three, uh, which is 203 days. So you got plenty of time uh, in there uh, for level three. Even if you wait until the results are released, you still have uh, plenty of time. But if you want to buy yourself 35 days, you can start with a section at level three. And since the reading, the order of the readings have changed this year, it's not a matter of book one, book two, but we call them sections now because they don't align with the 2022 book. So if you look at what book one has in it or what book two has in it, we call that sections now. So section two will have asset allocation, derivatives, and currency management. So there are six readings uh, in total. The derivatives and currency management do feed back on level two to some degree. Level three doesn't really flow very well from level two. It, uh, it sort of is a different a different perspective on the asset classes. It's not about the classes anymore, but it's more about portfolio management of that particular asset class. Level three only has 38 readings. Uh, it is lighter. However, it is uh, a different focus than level one and level two. Uh, level three has a lot more questions that don't have simple answers, but they have advantages and disadvantages. So there's a lot more in terms of analysis and evaluation. So a question would be, here's, uh, here's what we want to do. Here are three possible portfolios. Choose the best one. Well, there are trade-offs. You know, well, what are the constraints? What are the goals? Which portfolio meets that one the best? So it's not, a, it's not you know, uh, just something that you can memorize your way through. You have to know all of the, uh, the trade-offs. So you do, I think, need a bit more time at level three per reading uh, than you would at level one and level two. Uh, just, you know, sort of have that uh, top of mind. Level three, I expect your results November 2nd to November 9th. Again, it'll be one week later than level two. So... The uh, release of level two results in level three will depend on where level one is, and they're released, at least if it follows the May, uh, the May example, they're released in consecutive weeks. Level three takes a little bit longer because you do still have the manual grading of the, uh, of the AM part. And remember for uh, our candidates, um, if you do not pass, all of our uh, July and August packages for 2021, if you had a subscription, uh, for July of 2021 or August at level one, two, or three, all of them are one fee to pass. So if you don't pass, you don't pay again. Uh, you only pay for each level once. Uh, we started that in 2021. So I think we do have code. We didn't at first, but I think we have code now that if you had already bought in a level two 2021 or later subscription, uh, you cannot rebuy it again. It disallows you from buying it. Uh, sort of as a reminder of saying, well, listen, you don't have to pay for it, so why should we even let you attempt to buy it again? You just have to demonstrate, you know, that you didn't that you didn't pass. Uh, we trust most of you, but uh, you know, uh, you do have to you do have to show us, and uh, we'll extend your package uh, for you at uh, at no charge. So there it is, right there. Um, I didn't uh, put a whole bunch of uh, different pathways up. For those that did not pass, then you should take this. If you don't pass, my thinking is you should take the very next exam uh, of the same level that comes up. So if, if uh, results come out September 14th and you weren't successful uh, with level one, then you're going to take February because you're not starting from scratch. You're not starting from zero. So it's not as if you have to build out five or six months of time. You take the very next one. You just need a little bit more time. Same with level two. If you didn't make it through level two uh, and you have to repeat, you'll take, you'll take the February exam, which sets you up for November. And for level three, if you didn't make it through level three, you'll take the very next one you can, which is May. 
Uh, so if you did pass, well, then there's some thinking about, well, okay, which exam window do I want to sit for? Uh, and if you didn't, I don't think there is any thinking involved. I think you simply just take the next, uh, the next window available. Um, that said, let's move on to uh, the two other topics I want to talk about. The next one uh, is uh, about features. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about feature lists, but before I talk about them, I need to make a point. Uh, so just bear with me for now, and um, the point will become clear as I, uh, as I get to the point that I want to make. But it's always better to make a point with an example as opposed to just tell you what the point is so that you can then have that moment of, ah, I see. Uh, on the screen, I have two formulas. Uh, this one over here is uh, how we would uh, calculate the fixed rate on a swap. If we're given a bunch of swap rates, how we calculate the fixed rate on a swap. If you've uh, been through level two, you'll recognize that formula. If you're only at level one, uh, you may not recognize it as of yet. And everyone uh, should be familiar with approximate modified duration, uh, which looks like this. Your numerator is PV minus minus PV plus over two times the change in yield uh, times PV naught. And sometimes when we look at these formulas, and I've watched uh, some videos from other, um, from other uh, teachers uh, that present these formulas and say, well, you know, these, uh, these formulas are ones you're going to have to memorize because you're going to have to use them. And sometimes looking at them, it's not very intuitive exactly what they're doing. This over here, by the way, uh, is just a, 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 all we have to do to get to this formula is calculate the present value of a $1 bond. Uh, that's all it is. And I'll show you in a second that it's the present value of a $1 bond. This over here is super, super easy. It's a slope. You, know, you, just, you know how to calculate the slope of a line, right? Well, if it's a slope, and if we divide slope by the original starting point, what do we get? We get a sensitivity, right? And what is duration? Uh, it's a sensitivity uh, to uh, a, the price of a bond to uh, change in rates. It's just the slope of a line, rise over run. Well, we've all seen rise over run. Uh, so I'm not going to derive that one for you, but if you think about a line and you calculate the slope and you divide it by the original starting point, you'll, you'll be able to derive this formula on your own. But let's, uh, let's look at how, how is this possibly the present value of a $1 bond. And remember, we're trying to solve for the fixed rate, right? So let's make a $1 bond, and it's going to be a par bond, so it equals a dollar. And we have our payment over 1 plus R, and that's our uh, first discount rate, whatever it happens to be. And then we have our next payment, uh, and it'll be over 1 plus R, whatever the second spot rate is squared. And we just keep going until uh, we get to our last payment, and that'll be over 1 plus R, and that, of course, we'll just say N because it's the last one. Uh, plus whatever our future value is, we know our future value is 1, uh, and that'll be discounted back as well, 1 plus R N over N. I think you can see that that's nothing more than the present value of a bond. We saw this in level 1 quant when we did time value of money. You saw it in level 1 fixed income when we were calculating uh, the price of a bond. The only thing we don't know is payment. Right? Well, if we are using a $1 bond, the payment will be the interest rate. Because let's say the interest rate is 5%, then our payment up here will be 0 0.05 because it's a $1 bond. It's just a nice way to find uh, the fixed rate. Uh, but this doesn't look anything like that. Right? This, this makes a lot of sense. You would look at that and you'd say, okay, well, I see what we're doing there, but I don't see what that has to do with this particular formula. I'd like to be able to see it. So let's just uh, rewrite what we have here. 1 equals, and we'll just write it like this, payment multiplied by 1 over this will be 1 plus R1. And you could see that that's just the same thing that I've done. We could do the same thing with the second one, payment multiplied by 1 over 1 plus R2 squared. And we just keep going until we get to the last one, payment 1 over 1 plus Rn to the N. And over here we have the same thing because it's just, you know, it's just 1. So it's 1 plus 1 plus Rn to the N. Good enough. Well, what are these things over here? If we take our uh, different rates and we just say 1 divided by uh, whatever the rate is, discount for a period of time, 
these are uh, discount factors. So this is equal to one equals PMT multiplied by discount factor one, and this is PMT multiplied by discount factor two, and we just keep going. This is payment multiplied by discount factor N plus, our last one here is just discount factor N. Um, well, we can write this a little bit better. We have a common term here, right? Payment, so let's uh, just say one equals payment. And in brackets, we have discount factor one plus discount factor two, all the way to discount factor N. So it's the sum of all the discount factors, right? Plus discount factor N. And we're trying to solve for payment because our payment is gonna be our uh, fixed rate because we're using $1 here. So let's subtract DFN from both sides and divide through by the sum of the discount factors because we wanna isolate payment to one side. We will get one minus discount factor N over the sum of the discount factors, right? And uh, there you go. It's nothing more than an algebraic manipulation of the present value of a bond so that if we're given a whole bunch of different rates, swap rates, uh, we calculate our discount factors and then calculating the fixed rate on a swap is super, super simple. Okay, um, I'm making a point later on. I just wanted to show you this so that the point I make later on becomes a little more obvious. Let's move on to feature lists. Okay, let's uh, assume I'm going to bring you back to university now, and some of you are probably still in university, your second to last year, or your last year, but let's imagine you're back in university and there is a course offered next semester on valuation. Uh, and this is the list of features for class one and class two. You get to pick the section you want. Uh, whatever section you want, you get to pick it. Class one uh, is full of interactive whiteboards uh, and a bunch of breakout rooms collaborative pod seating, ergonomic chairs, that's nice, right? One gigabyte internet access right to the desktop. Offers an adaptive question bank with 5,000 questions, adaptive meaning that the more you get right, the harder the questions get. Uh, it has a bunch of mock exams for you. It gives you flashcards. There's a PDF library of all the slides and all the presentations. Uh, all the lectures uh, are both live and streaming, so they're captured and then uh, streaming for review later on. There is a student forum in which you can uh, communicate and collaborate and ask questions of other uh, uh, students in the classroom. And of course, as you interact with all of these things, you have progress stats. And there are many, many, many more features uh, in the first class. There's a lot of features. Class two uh, is just a room with desks there is a whiteboard and uh, the uh, professor uses a marker. Which one would you sign up for? Uh, and I want you to think about this in terms of how you make decisions in uh, if you're buying a provider for CFA uh, content, how you make decisions. Which one would you sign up for? Um, and before you answer that, let me take you back to a conversation. For those of you who have been through university and are done, for those of you who are in university, you'll recognize this conversation. Everybody will recognize this conversation because it's a conversation every student has had. I remember having this conversation uh, and uh, I've asked uh, over the last couple of weeks, everybody that has been through university, I said, do you ever remember having this type of conversation? And it's unanimous. Everybody remembers this type of conversation. So it begins kind of like this. Um, when you pick your classes for the next semester, sometimes you pick them two, three months in advance. Sometimes it's two or three weeks in advance. Every school is different in, in how you, uh, uh, the time frame of when you select your classes. Uh, but you do select your classes for the next semester well before the next semester begins and you're sitting with, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in uh, you know, some uh, um, student lounge somewhere in the library or, or in the common area, common center area, and you're picking classes and somebody says, hey, um, there's a valuation class offered next semester. Now, now, before I say anything more, I want you to think about the the very first or second question you ask about that class. One common question is, when's it offered? Because nobody wants a Friday morning 8.30 class. I don't even know why there is. There are classes that are scheduled Friday at 8.30. They do happen. I don't know who 
in all of their wisdom, decides that that's a, a bright thing to do. I guess you got to punish a professor at some point, and if you got to punish a professor, you give them a Friday morning 8.30 class, which then punishes students who have to take the class. But, you know, other than when is it offered, as long as it's not offered Friday at, at 8.30 or even worse, I've seen a Friday afternoon 4 to 7 class. Who would even sign up for that, right? Um, what's, what's the big question you ask? I'm sure you're all saying it right now, screaming it. Who's teaching it? Almost everybody I talk to, other than the students who are in first year because they don't know enough to know the difference between the professors, but any first year student having a conversation with a third year student say, oh yeah, I've got, I've got stats uh, 105. Oh, who's teaching? Always, who's teaching? Who's teaching? Who's teaching? So let's go back to class one and class two. Um, this is taught by Warren Buffett. Uh, there's no features though. It's just a room with desks, a whiteboard, and a marker. Which class do you sign up for? You see, in all of these feature lists, what's missing? Uh, the main feature, who's teaching it? Because it makes a difference. Think back again to your university days. Did you ever take a class that you were excited about only to have a professor completely beat all the passion out of you? That when you got through that class, you never, ever wanted to take another class with that professor ever again. Everyone has. And there are some professors you had classes with that you will follow them around and say, I'll take whatever class this guy is offering or, or, or this woman is offering because it was fantastic. Uh, because they know how to teach. They know how to engage. They know how to keep you interested. They know how to tell a story so that their classes are not boring. Uh, they, you, you can't tell where the material ends and where they begin. They're one and the same. Um, those are the fun classes. I know that I've taken uh, some classes in my undergrad purely because of the person teaching it. Not necessarily because I needed it. You know, I needed some credits. You have required classes and then you have to fill in your other credits. Well, when you fill in your other credits, it's not what course do I want, especially when you get to third and fourth year. It's who's teaching. You know, I don't want this person, whatever, whatever they're teaching, I never want this person ever again. You know, so you have to think about who is teaching that class. When we look at causation, uh, so let's say that we're interested in variable A and outcome B. And we want to know, does A cause B? And let's say that B is success. So in whatever it is, class success, course success, exam success, whatever. We want to know, does A cause B? Um, all of these, with a terrible teacher, uh, will not cause B. These, all of these features are not sufficient uh, to pass a test. They're not sufficient to learn the content. However, if you have the right person teaching, it is sufficient. Uh, and a necessary condition. So the main feature who's teaching is both a necessary and a sufficient condition. So we say that A causes B when A is both necessary and sufficient. Well, first of all, A causes B when A is necessary. A, the presence of A is necessary to, call, to, to, to cause B, but only A causes B when it's both necessary and sufficient. The only feature that matters is who is teaching this course. So when you uh, look at different providers, and I, I've had this thrown at me as well, uh, this company over here has 49 features. You only have seven. Explain yourself. Well, all of those features are meaningless if you don't have the right person teaching. They're all meaningless. If you have the right person, you don't need all those features. If you have all those features and you don't have the right person, they're not going to help you at all. And uh, I'm also going to pick on a few of these features uh, over here when we talk about process. Uh, and I'm going to compare the uh, failure rates uh, for uh, the CFA levels to failure rates uh, at univer in university courses. So with this being said, um, let's tie what I did on the first screen uh, to what I just said to make the point a little bit clearer. So here are five swap rates. What's the fixed rate on a swap? 
Now, if I would have started with that question, here are five swap rates, what's the fixed rate on a swap? It might have taken some time to figure it out. There might have been some blank stares. There might have been, oh, what is that formula again? What's that formula? And even if you forget the formula from two screens ago, it's the present value of a $1 bond. You could start with that and just use algebra and you can derive the formula yourself. So what do we need? We need discount factors, right? So what is our first discount factor? It's going to be 1 divided by 1.002. And that'll give us 0.998. And uh, bear with me here, because I'm going to show you something else uh, that you've probably wondered about. What's our discount factor here? It is 1 over. Now let's be careful. We're calculating a swap rate, which means we're not using government spot uh, rates. Uh, we're using interbank rates. So uh, how would we calculate our discount factor here? It is 1 plus 0 0.003 multiplied by, since it's two years, 720 over 360. Simple interest. Well, why am I using simple interest? Why am I not compounding this thing? Does anybody out there already know it? Show of hands if you already know it. I can see right through your cameras, by the way, so I can see everybody who's got their hands up. Show of hands why you know why we're using simple interest. Uh, these are uh, interbank rates. Interbank rates tend to be quoted continuously compounded, e to the rt. So if you take the natural log of that, what do you get? rt, rt. Uh, so because they're quoted continuously compounded, uh, you would not compound an already compounded rate. Uh, so if we continue on with this, uh, you'll find that this discount factor here is 0.98232. This one over here is 0.97276, and this one over here is 0.95694, and we add them up. You'll get 4.90406. What's the fixed rate on the swap? It is 1 minus the last one, 0.95694, over the sum of all of them, 0.490406, and we'll get 0.878 percent done. Sometimes considered a very challenging uh, topic in derivatives is uh, valuing a swap and calculating the fixed rate on a swap. Look how super duper easy simple that was. Would all the interactive whiteboards have made a difference? Would all of the interactive question banks, would all the PDFs, would all the flashcards have made a difference unless somebody simply just explained it to you? as simple as possible that even someone in grade nine who understands multiplication and division would say, oh, okay, I get that. I don't quite know what a swap is, and says the grade nine, but I understand the math. The math is not difficult at all. That's the difference between uh, all of those feature lists and listening uh, to somebody give you uh, uh, something that you'll always have forever. Uh, which is a deep understanding of exactly what is going on here. There is no need to memorize RFX equals 1 minus DFN over the sum of the discount factors. You don't need to memorize that and say, well, that's not very intuitive at all. You simply just know it now. Let's move on. Okay, so on the screen, I've got three charts which show the pass rates. Uh, level 1 since 2006, level 2 and level 3. And I had put these up before when we talked about what was going on uh, at the end of the curve over here with the, this was the last exam, the, the very low pass rates. But what I want to do here is contrast um, going through the process of obtaining uh, the C of A charter versus uh, getting a finance degree. Um, and let's just look at our average pass rates. We're going to ignore what happened down here in the last exam and just say, okay, well, we don't know enough to know what's going on there. Let's assume it's an outlier. Level one, average pass rates of 43%. So do not pass. Uh, average, 57%. For level two, do not pass. Average is 54%. And even for level three, do not pass is 45%. Now, if we think about the process of going through uh, uh, and earning uh, the CFA charter versus uh, going through and earning a finance degree, 
Uh, if you control for the types of courses that you take, in other words, in your finance degree, you're going to take all the asset classes. Uh, you're going to take portfolio management, derivatives. You, you have to take uh, micro and macroeconomics. That's pretty standard. I think two or four accounting courses are pretty standard. Statistics, pretty standard stuff that you have to take. Um, in doing these degrees, uh, in each of those particular courses, you dive a lot deeper uh, than you do uh, when you're looking at the content at CFA, at whether it be level one or level two. We'll leave level three out of it uh, for the uh, time being, but uh, for level one and level two. These are common uh, courses that you would find in any university. The content you'll find at level one and level two uh, is not proprietary to CFAI. In fact, it's pretty much in every textbook that you're going to come across. Uh, for stats, you're going to cover off, uh, you know, probability, hypotheses, testing, probability distributions, linear regression, multiple regression, time series. These are very common topics that you'll go through. Same with the economics section for micro and macro. There's nothing proprietary uh, to CFA. So, you know, we can't say, well, the content is so different uh, when you're uh, going through level one and level two. Uh, that this is not something we see in university. That's why the failure rates are so high, because it is so uniquely different. That's not true. Uh, if you take any fixed income course at any university, you will dive a lot deeper uh, than what fixed income is at level one and level two uh, for uh, the CFA uh, process. Yet you don't see these types of failure rates in university. In fact, uh, if I had a course that had that type of failure rate, um, the, the department head is showing up in my office. What's going on? There's a meeting with the dean's office. What's going on? I better have an audit trail. Uh, I better be able to document everybody's score, show exactly how that score came to be, show that I had nothing to do with the process. So there better be a grading rubric uh, students better have known what the expectations were before the assignment. The breakdown of the grades were clearly visible before the assignment. And then after the assignment, I could defend every grade. After the exam, I could defend every score. It would have to be to justify failure rates that high. And even if I did produce failure rates that high, the argument would be you uh, did not match uh, the, uh, the rigor uh, with the level of the student. You know, if it was a second year course, maybe you're teaching at a master's level for a second year course. That's the only way we can justify a 54% failure rate. And if you do have 54, you're grading on a curve. You can't, we can't let that sit. So, um, and no student uh, would accept that. You know, your, your course has a 54% failure rate. Th th that's unacceptable. Uh, but, you know, at level two, you produce a 54% failure rate, and there is no justification that has to happen from CFAI. They feel no need to justify anybody's score. It is what it is. And in fact, beginning in this last year, you're getting less information about your score. It's becoming less transparent, and there it is. But that would never stand at any university. Now, I do not think that there is anything in the grading process that's biased. Uh, when we're talking about CFAI. I do not think that there's anything in the exam that is unfair. I think the questions being asked are probably as fair as they can be. There was an LOS that said you must describe this kind of content. The question was about that type of content. I don't think that there's anything about the exam or anything about the grading of the exam that is unfair. Yet, we're still producing these failure rates. Now, level one you know, 57% fail. You can always make the argument uh, that if a rigorous school let in everybody, they'd produce these type of failure rates as well, simply because a lot of people simply just didn't belong there. Well, there's no entrance requirement uh, other than, uh, uh, you know, having done certain things in your life, like being in a certain level uh, in university. Other than that, there is no entrance requirement. You don't submit transcripts. You don't show your grades. You don't have to qualify. It's not as if, you know, out of every 100 applicants, uh, 96 are rejected. This, it's not Harvard. Uh, that means that you can apply to write level one 
And as long as you check a few boxes, off you go. It doesn't matter if you had a C minus or a D plus average, off you go. So you can make the case at level one uh, that there is a, a group of people that probably shouldn't have started to begin with. And I'm going to write out two, two words here. Aptitude and attitude. Now, if you are a C student, wherever you happen to be, the difference uh, between an A student and a C student is not aptitude, it's attitude. you got to change this P to a T. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, I've had, you know, at uh, the different places that I've taught students who, you know, on, in the first week are already talking about how little they have to do. Do I have to read the book? Do I have to buy the book? If I have your slides, are they enough? Do I have to attend class? Do I have to do this? Do I have to do that? Looking to just get by. And usually the ones that are asking me these questions usually end up being uh, the C- minus students who are more than happy with a 62 or a 63% just to get by, are more than happy to just get by. I don't believe that they lack aptitude. They lack attitude. So a low score says more about your attitude uh, than it does about, uh, about your ability to get the job done. So, you know, you can make the case that level one uh, has, uh, you know, a bunch of people who don't belong there who have the wrong attitude, looking to just get by, looking to do the least amount of work possible, and they fail, and well, there you go. Um, you can also make the case at level two uh, you know, at 54% that, look, there is a, a statistical probability that if you have a certain level of ability or that you've achieved a certain level of knowledge of the content, that if you take the exam enough times, you're eventually going to pass uh, and then move on to level two where you'll probably uh, end up failing. So in this 54%, how much of this 54% is made up of you know, the uh, individuals who tried two, three, four times at level one. Oh, there, statistically, I got by. I got lucky this time, and I'm going to go to the next level and write it. Uh, maybe. But this is a problem right down here. This is the big problem. This is the one that you simply just can't, uh, uh, can't write away. 45%. And level three, I would say, is comparable in uh, learning uh, when we're looking at the style of learning. Level one, you might be able to memorize your way through level one. Maybe you don't understand a lot and you could probably get by. By the way, that's becoming less and less true uh, with the uh, exam uh, uh, having changed uh, over the years. Uh, it is less and less true at level one that you can memorize your way through. You're probably not going to memorize your way through level two and you cannot do it at level three, which means you really have to know uh, uh, what's going on. So because of the type of learning, uh, it's more analysis and evaluation, this is, this is the type of learning skills you develop at a master's level. Uh, I cannot think of any place that could possibly justify a 45% failure rate. Now you can argue again, well, there were no entrance requirements. Yeah, but you had to get through level one and you had to get through level two. If you got through level one and level two and you're at level three, there is nothing about you that says there's a 45% probability you're not going to make it. So what's going on here? And again, I don't think the grading process is biased or flawed. I don't think that the exam questions themselves are biased or flawed. There are a number of things you can point to that this is self-study. Uh, and it's hard to maintain a schedule or stay motivated or, or be... Uh, you know, on time uh, um, when it's self-study. Again, you would have figured that out at level one and level two. You shouldn't be learning that at level three saying, oh, I forgot the last two exams. Uh, you know, that's right. I got to give myself more time. Um, so it's hard to justify that failure rate. Now, our uh, pass rates are significantly higher uh, than this. Uh, you know, we have 43, 46, and 55. Right away, I, I can tell you our pass rates are higher. We used to have uh, something called the one fee to completion. One, uh, OF, we shortened it to OFTC. Uh, and it was 1,200 at level one. Uh, and uh, that covered off everything. 
all the way to level three, no matter how many times you had to take it. You paid one fee and it covered you all the way to completion. And we had a $900 one that started at level two and carried you to level three. Now, it was cheaper if you bought level one, level two, and level three, as opposed to paying 1200. Built into the 1200 was insurance against multiple failures. And we thought, well, these packages will appeal very nicely uh, to candidates who might not have uh, uh, the level of confidence uh, that they can pass one, two, three right away. Those who felt, well, you know what, one, two, three, I can pass it, never bought these. And we sold a significant amount of these, not, not in the hundreds, but significantly higher. Uh, uh, you know, we were in the thousands. So we have, if you're thinking about sample size, our N uh, is greater than 200 easily so that we can draw some very good generalizations uh, from this sample. And what we found was uh, the people who uh, progressed versus the people who repeated. The people who repeated was about 7%. 7% repeated the same level. And because there was no fee, you paid once and then you could just use it as many times as you need to. Um, we had the best numbers in terms of pass rate that we could get, the cleanest numbers possible. Uh, and only 7% were actually using the embedded insurance policy in those packages. So we decided that, listen, 93% are not using the insurance policy. So let's cancel this. Uh, and once we canceled these packages, we canceled this one first, then we canceled the second one. Then we waited a year for them to fall off, uh, you know, for people to matriculate out of them. Then we decided to make each level one fee to pass as opposed to have a one fee to completion. Let's say you buy level one instead, and then you just don't pay again till you pass level one, period. It's the same thing, it's just per level. We could never uh, do that if our failure rates were this high. I mean, carrying 7% of our subscriptions each year for free, big deal, uh, we can do that. Um, but many of you are familiar with our pricing structure. We are very, very proud of being uh, a low cost uh, alternative uh, without sacrificing the quality of the content that you're getting, but just being very accessible. We're very proud of that and we're gonna maintain that for as long as we possibly can. However, it is a business that does have costs. And if we had to carry 57% or 54% or 45% of candidates every year from exam to exam, not for the price we charge, we would have to raise it significantly. So I look at that and I say, well, you know, you have an industry pass rate that looks like this at level one, this at level two, and this at level three. And I'm really just gonna focus on level three because that's the one I really can't explain is why after getting through all of this and probably having significant work experience behind you, are the failure rates this high? Um, and again, uh, uh, you know, it comes down to process. And as I mentioned before, I think those, you know, an over uh, um, exaggeration of the feature list. We got all these features, uh, I think, draw people into making the wrong decisions. Learning is about putting in the time. There is no other way to do it. In the two, three, four thousand years that, that uh, we've been aware of learning, uh, you know, going all the way back. Uh, to uh, the Greeks, uh, to Plato's school. Uh, uh, it's about putting in the time. There's no shortcut. If there were a shortcut, you would have been introduced to it in university. It would have found its way into the education system a long time ago. The test prep industry doesn't know something that the education system doesn't know. I'll tell you that right now. It's not as if the test prep industry says, we figured it all out. There is a fast and easy way to learn anything you want, and we have a monopoly on it. That the universities and, and schools are simply not using, that is untrue. If there is a more efficient and effective way of learning, it would have found its way into universities long ago. But it didn't, because it's called putting in the time. Those with great ability, still have to put in the time, they just have to put in less time. Those with less ability can know just as much, but they have to put in more time. That's where the word attitude comes in. But when we hit these features, 
Some of these features are designed to cut down the amount of time you spend. Well, that's the wrong thing. Now, we've been guilty of this as well. Uh, we have designed certain things that save you time. We present you with a formula list uh, to save you the time of compiling your own. Well, I think that's the wrong thing to do. I've been uncomfortable with formula lists for a while. We do it because we get asked, but I look at it and I say, I'm not doing you any favors here. I'm really not doing you any favors by, by compiling this list for you because I'm giving you a sense of completion, which means, oh, I've just saved myself all this time. But if learning is about putting in the time, what am I doing with a bunch of features that save you all that time? Um, and the one feature, I think, which is probably the most detrimental is, the, uh, is question banks built on questions that look like exam questions, whether they be multiple choice questions or um, uh, essay form, uh, sort of structured uh, response uh, type questions or vignette style questions. That is the industry standard. And when we uh, started, we looked at that and said, okay, well, I guess if that's the industry standard, that's what we'll do. We'll deliver those types of, of question banks and questions as well. But over the last year or two, I've become very uncomfortable with it as a writer of, of, of these questions. And by the way, I never really wanted to write questions. I, we hired out uh, our question writing in the very beginning, much to our extreme disappointment, which is why I became uh, a writer to, you know, sort of get around the disappointment of what's available out there. Um, as I was writing these, you know, on certain LOSs, uh, I'd get out four or five questions on it saying, you know, this is nowhere near enough, four to five questions. But it's all of this setup, all this big question setup. So-and-so works for this company in this capacity. It has this client who wants to swap C Exhibit 1. Uh, C Exhibit 2 for the current term structure of, of swap rates and, and then now do this. You know, and if you have four or five questions around the same thing, there's only so much variation you can bring in. Um, you know, and I've always been uncomfortable with that because uh, of all the textbooks I have, and I have two bookshelves right here in my office as I turn my head and look at them, two bookshelves full of textbooks. As a professor, uh, um, publishers send you textbooks all the time. You just get free textbooks. You collect textbooks uh, through no fault of your own. They just show up in your mailbox. Here's a textbook. Uh, uh, what do you think? You know, if you ever want to use it, please order. Uh, you know, so I, I spent some time going through the end of chapter questions that textbooks have, and they don't have that. They don't have this, this, this constant exam mode question bank. Uh, it's a lot of drills. It's a lot of different types of questions. Um, and so I start thinking about that, going, could that be it? Could it be the process? that is creating uh, this do not pass rate. 45% of otherwise, I think, high ability candidates, because you're at level three for God's sake, high ability candidates, how do we justify 45% failure rate? There must be something in the process itself. Um, and I think, I think it's a heavy reliance on all these features uh, to save you as much time as you possibly can when the very essence of learning is about putting in the time. Uh, and I don't think that there's any way around that. So we're going to change as of this year going into 2022, only for 2022. 2021, we, we're pretty much uh, set in what we have. Uh, we're going to continue doing what we do, but we're going to change our question bank slightly. Um, Every year there are new readings that show up and you got to fill in the question bank. Well, we're not going to this year. We're going to do something different. Uh, and I'm not ready to show you what it looks like yet because uh, we've been developing it for a while. We have a new site that's launching uh, in a little while. All brand new look, brand new site, brand new functionality. And we're introducing it uh, at that point. And I think that's going to make the difference. Uh, so to give you an analogy of how we're going to do this for many of you uh, have played sports uh, and quite a few of you have probably been on organized teams uh, so let's just think of whether it be uh, baseball basketball soccer hockey football whatever the case is we've all played some sport uh, and I want you to think about uh, the game when it's game time versus practice what do you do in practice? You know, do you constantly play the game? 
So you show up at practice, okay, split up in teams and play a game. Next practice, split up in teams and play a game. You know, there are times where you do that, but what is practice mostly? It's practice on a particular technique. So for hockey, for example, you need certain things. You need accuracy in your shooting, you need speed, uh, and you need strength. So there's some strength training involved. There's speed skating. Sometimes your practice is nothing but speed. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, in and around the pylons. Do it again, in and around, again and again and again and again. Um, but you're not just playing the game. And I would put it to you as this. Um, if there were two teams, Team A did nothing but play the game. Every practice, they broke up in two teams and they played the game again and again and again. Team B focused on drills, focused on their speed, built their speed, focused on accuracy, focused on strength, and then they rotated so that they were always working on something else and then they played every now and then to bring it all together, but then they did drills most of the time and then you had those two teams play. And let's say they put in the same amount of hours, but they just did it differently. One, one team did nothing but play all the time. I would bet dollars to donuts that the team that drilled would beat handily the team that did nothing uh, but, uh, uh, but um, play. Um, I'm reminded of my uh, uh, younger days when uh, I uh, took martial arts and took boxing. Um, when you went into the boxing club, there was the short, the, the, the least numerous equipment was the boxing ring. Well, you're boxing. Shouldn't there be nothing but boxing rings? No, because boxing comes down to about half a dozen to a dozen techniques that you need. Uh, you need speed, so there's a speed bag. You need strength, so there's the heavy bag. Uh, you need endurance, so there's the rope and there's the running. So when you went into the gym uh, to train, very rarely were you actually in the ring fighting. Very rarely. Uh, uh, it was a lot of drills. Now, if you put somebody, if you taught somebody boxing by saying every time you're just going to get in the ring and fight, every single time, they would never develop ones, they'd never have enough time to develop any one skill well enough to be an all-around fighter. And I think that's what's going on with, uh, with these question banks and these, these feature lists is that it's not effective and efficient. Now, I may have somebody out there that says, no, 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 hang on now. I use question banks and they work well for me. And maybe they did. Much like drinking water will eventually get rid of a headache. But a Tylenol is far more effective. So maybe, sure, it worked for you, but did you try something else? Perhaps, perhaps it worked for you, but something else would have worked better. Uh, so that means... Maybe you'll argue that your question bank was effective, but I'm going to argue that it wasn't efficient. Maybe it was effective for some people, but it wasn't efficient. And I think we have a far more effective and more efficient way that, uh, that can work on this. Now, uh, with our uh, pass rates, I don't know that we really need to focus too much on getting that done, but still, 7%. If at a master's level, I failed 7% of my class, <laughs> there's still going to be a meeting in the dean's office to explain myself of why I have that kind of failure rate. What am I doing wrong? Right away, the blame would be on me. What's going on? I better be able to justify that. So, there it is. I've taken up uh, enough of your time. Oh, by the way, one last point before I go. If you're looking for the next applied series, uh, it'll be tomorrow. I've been trying to do it all weekend long. It's on volatility and, and, and particularly volatility skew on the S&P uh, index. Something very interesting is going on there and, uh, and I want to show you. However, every time I try to connect this weekend, um, I just get a spinning beach ball that, that the, the system is not responding for some reason. And I think I need a live feed uh, to get my uh, volatility skew chart uh, up. I think every time it goes looking for the uh, for the implied volatility, since the exchange is closed, it's not finding anything and echoing back with, you know, spinning beach ball. So that'll be tomorrow. Anyways, there it is. Um, you know, take it for what it is. Uh, and uh, we'll wrap it here.